Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the case of Josef Fritzl. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So I'll start with the background, then move to the timeline of the crimes, and then I'll get to the mental health and personality factors. Starting with the background, Josef Fritzl was born in Amstetten, Austria, on April 9, 1935. He was an only child. His father left when he was four, and his mother raised him alone. Fritzl was frequently physically and verbally maltreated by his mother. He would marry, at age 21, to a 17-year-old named Rosemarie Byers. The couple had seven children. One of them was named Elizabeth. They lived in a house that was built around 1890. Fritzl worked for a construction material company. He would later work as a technical equipment salesman. In 1967, Fritzl broke into the residence of a 24-year-old nurse, held a knife to her throat, and committed an assault of a sexual nature. In this video, when I use the term assault, that is the type of assault to which I'm referring. It is thought that Fritzl also assaulted a 21-year-old in a separate incident. He was arrested for the assault of the nurse, convicted, and sentenced to 18 months in prison. He would be released after a year. In 1977, when Elizabeth was 11 years old, Fritzl started assaulting her. He built an extension to the house in 1978. He had a permit for the improvement, but he made the basement larger than the permit indicated. Starting in 1981 or 1982, he used that space to construct a cell. When the cell was completed, eight different doors needed to be unlocked to reach it. Two of the doors had electronic locking devices. In August of 1984, when Elizabeth was 18, Fritzl asked her to help him carry a door to the basement of the family home. After installing the door, Fritzl held a towel soaked in ether over Elizabeth's face until she was unconscious. He then locked her into this cell that he had constructed in the basement. People obviously noticed that Elizabeth was missing. The police started investigating. Fritzl forced Elizabeth to write letters saying that she was with a friend and tired of her family. The letters indicated that no one should try to look for her or she would flee the country. Fritzl mailed these letters from another place in Austria so they would bear a postmark from that location, and then he gave them to the police. Fritzl would go down to the basement just about every day to deliver supplies. Many of the times he would assault Elizabeth, sometimes several times in one day. This would go on for 24 years. Elizabeth was assaulted over 3,000 times. Elizabeth had a bed, refrigerator, hot plate, television, cassette player, and a radio in the basement. The basement had rats and roaches, and it was extremely humid. For the first five years of captivity, she was alone most of the time. In the summer, the temperature would get extremely hot in that cell. While in captivity, Elizabeth gave birth to seven children. She had a miscarriage in 1986. In 1988, Elizabeth had a daughter, Kirsten. This daughter would remain in the cell with Elizabeth. In 1990, she had a son, Stefan. He remained in the cell. In 1992, she had a daughter named Lisa. Fritzl put Lisa in a cardboard box and placed her outside the family home, making it look like Elizabeth left her there. He even had Elizabeth write a note saying the child should be cared for. Social services allowed Fritzl and his wife to care for Lisa. They did not have access to Fritzl's criminal record because it was expunged in accordance with Austrian law. In 1993, Fritzl started an expansion of the chamber in the basement after Elizabeth had another child. The chamber was 380 square feet. He expanded it to 590 square feet. He forced Elizabeth and her children to participate in the construction, having them dig out dirt with their bare hands. Another daughter, Monica, was born in 1994. Fritzl placed her in a chair outside the door of his house. Rosemary received a phone call asking her to provide for the child. Rosemary called the police and told them that the caller sounded like Elizabeth, but she didn't know how Elizabeth would have access to their unlisted number that was only recently assigned to them. In 1996, Elizabeth gave birth to twin boys. Alexander would survive, but the other son died within three days. 
Fritzel was aware the boy was going to die, but he did nothing to prevent it. He incinerated the body afterward. Alexander would live upstairs after being discovered like Lisa and Monica. In 2002, Elizabeth gave birth to another son, Felix. He would stay in the basement with Kirsten and Stefan. Fritzl discouraged Elizabeth and the children from attempting to escape by telling them they would be gassed and electrocuted if they did so. Kirsten became seriously ill and would lose consciousness on April 19, 2008. Fritzl arranged for Kirsten to be transported to a local hospital where they determined she had kidney failure and admitted her. People at the hospital grew suspicious and called the police. Fritzl gave them yet another letter written by Elizabeth and told them that she was involved in a cult, which is a claim he had made earlier as well. Seven days after Kirsten's admission to the hospital, Fritzl allowed Elizabeth, Felix, and Stefan to come upstairs. He told Rosemary that Elizabeth had decided to come home after being missing for 24 years. Elizabeth and the two children went to the hospital, but an anonymous tip led the police to them. They were detained and questioned. The police threatened to charge Elizabeth for neglecting her children. Elizabeth told her story to the police, including how she had been repeatedly assaulted while being held captive for 24 years. She would only tell them if they promised she would never have to see her father again. Fritzel was arrested, and he told the police how to enter the secret chamber in the basement. The investigation revealed that Fritzel may have been planning to release Elizabeth and the three children before Kirsten became ill. He had Elizabeth write letters that made it seem like she was thinking about coming home. In March 2009, Fritzel pled guilty and was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 15 years. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. The victims of Fritzel had a number of symptoms after being freed from captivity. They had endured an incredible amount of suffering. It was reported that Kirsten and Stefan had anxiety and panic attacks. All three children who were raised upstairs by Fritzel and Rosemary received treatment for anger and resentment. In July of 2008, the relationship between Elizabeth and her mother broke down because Elizabeth was upset that Rosemary was so passive while Elizabeth was being held captive. It has been reported that Elizabeth eventually forgave her mother for believing Fritzl's story. Elizabeth and all six children receive ongoing therapy. Now, as far as Fritzl, we see that he had a strict upbringing. Like many offenders who engage in sexual domination, Fritzl had a strained relationship with his mother. She had mistreated him, as I mentioned. He had fantasies about having sex with her and dominating her. He developed paraphilias at age 15. Voyeurism was the first one. Fritzl was described by people in the community as polite and hardworking. He was financially successful. He owned restaurants, guest houses, and a hotel with 40 rooms. That hotel mysteriously caught fire, and the police thought that maybe Fritzl set that fire to collect insurance money, but that was never proven. Fritzl was described as domineering by his wife. We know that he was highly intelligent and he seemed to have enough social skill so that he did not arouse suspicion. I'm not aware of any mental health diagnosis ever being given to Fritzl. One report indicated that he had a profound personality disorder, but didn't say which disorder he was diagnosed with. One can make the argument that his behavior aligns with both antisocial and narcissistic personality disorders. Looking specifically at psychopathy, he appears to have more factor one psychopathic characteristics than factor two. From factor one, we see he's manipulative, he was a pathological liar, he did not accept responsibility, and he lacks empathy, remorse, and guilt, although he did show some remorse when he was in court. From factor two, we see criminality and early behavioral problems. As far as narcissism, he had a sense of entitlement, he was arrogant, and he had grandiose fantasies. After he was arrested, he said that he was trying to protect Elizabeth from the outside world because she would not obey any rules. He said that the sexual activity was consensual. He actually thought people would believe him. Fritzl was sadistic. Causing Elizabeth to suffer brought him satisfaction. He would often assault her in front of the children to create additional humiliation. He would also physically attack her and turn off the lights for days at a time to punish her and her children. Fritzl was fully aware that he was committing crimes. Taking a look at his personality profile, 
We see that he was high in openness to experience. He was intellectually curious. We see high conscientiousness. He worked hard and he was organized. Mid-range extroversion, low agreeableness, and low neuroticism. In the case of Josef Fritzl, we see a disturbing combination of personality traits that all come together. His dangerous drive combined with intelligence and some level of impulse control to create an extremely dangerous offender, one who could plan a crime for years. He had learned from his time in prison that getting away with these types of crimes required diligence. He was willing to put in the work to gain the gratification later. Many psychopathic offenders are caught because they give in to impulses. Fritzl was willing to play the long game, which is really, I think, the characteristic that made him particularly dangerous. It is the difference between an offender getting caught after one assault or being arrested after 3,000 assaults. I believe Fritzl convinced himself that even though he was doing something wrong, he wasn't committing murder. Now, of course, he was charged with murder because his actions caused the death of one of Elizabeth's sons. But at first, he refused to plead guilty to that charge. He had it in his mind that there was still a way out of all this at the end. He could explain away Elizabeth's disappearance and nobody would know about all the assaults and other crimes. I think that's what motivated him to help Kirsten. He knew that if she died, he would be guilty of murder and would have to keep Elizabeth and the other two children captive forever. Other factors could have played a role in this decision as well. It seems reasonable to believe that his sex drive had decreased, so the value of keeping Elizabeth captive was reduced. He could have also been growing tired of maintaining a double life. He wanted to integrate his two lives to make things simpler. For example, he drove out of town to shop for groceries and other supplies to avoid raising suspicion about all these items he was purchasing. That was a lot of work. That was time that he probably wanted to spend doing something else. This takes me to the last question. Was this preventable? Well, as I mentioned, Fritzl was good at fitting in. With the limited amount of contact he had with people in the community, nobody would see anything out of the ordinary with his personality. Superficial charm works very well in the short term. The only person who spent a lot of time with him was Rosemary, and Fritzl was able to manipulate her fairly easily. She didn't really question anything that he did. There were two other groups that could have caught him that really stand out, the social workers and the police, starting with the social workers. When the people from social services were trying to figure out if Fritzl and Rosemary could adopt Elizabeth's daughter, again, this is a daughter who mysteriously appeared on the doorstep, they didn't find anything out of the ordinary. Even when the second and third child magically appeared, they said Fritzl very plausibly explained how this happened. The social workers did not have good investigative skills. They make Scooby-Doo and Shaggy look like Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Is this really something these social workers saw frequently? Babies just appearing out of nowhere? How can this be reasonably explained? Did they think that one of the flight supervisors at the Stork factory started snorting lines of cocaine and delivered babies to the wrong locations? He might have said, I don't even care where these babies go. I'm just going to deliver them to anybody. Of course, to be fair, most social workers don't carry around ground-penetrating radar, and their secret basement detection training is dangerously minimal. Now looking at the police, I think what bothers me about how the police behaved in this situation is that they only seemed to really put in a lot of effort in defining Elizabeth when they thought that she was guilty of a crime. That's when they really became interested and motivated. So back to that question, was this preventable? I think more could have been done, but it would have been difficult to prevent this. Fritzl's behavior was extremely unusual. Nobody would automatically think that somebody would want to do what he did or would actually put in the effort to build a cell in a basement, to go through all that work to accomplish his criminal goal. Those are my thoughts on Josef Fritzl. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.